Hello and a very warm welcome indeed to this latest edition of Quadriga coming to you from the heart of Berlin. And defence and security experts from around the world will be gathering here in Germany this weekend for the highly influential Munich Security Conference. It comes at a time when experts say the world is on the brink, on the brink, that is, of a new arms race. Well, are they right? Certainly there are growing tensions between the world's two key nuclear powers, the United States and Russia, with both sides threatening to upgrade their nuclear capacities, and China is also expanding its nuclear arsenal. Not to mention other countries with nuclear ambitions, such as, of course, North Korea. So our question here on Quadriga this week is, the new arms race a more dangerous world? And to answer that question, or to discuss that question, I'm joined here in the studio by Constanze Stelzenmüller, who is an expert on international relations and security policy with the Brookings Institution in Washington. She says the world has become a lot more dangerous in the last 12 months. Problems with effective arms control are only one of several reasons. Also with us is Malta Leming, an author and editor of the Berlin-based daily newspaper Der Tagesspiegel. He argues that none of the great powers profits from any kind of military escalation. The world is getting very unpredictable, but not necessarily more dangerous. Hmm. And a warm welcome too to Xanthi Hall from the German section of the Nobel Prize winning international campaign to abolish nuclear weapons, widely known as ICANN. She says, since the adoption by the United Nations of a nuclear ban last July, I am optimistic that nuclear weapons can be abolished in my lifetime. Xanthi Hall, thank you very much for that note of optimism. <laughs> at the, it's a long-term note of optimism, you're saying, in your lifetime. Yes. Tell us about how safe or unsafe the world that we currently <laughs> live in is. It's terrifically unsafe. And uh, some say it's even less safe than it was during the Cold War. Um, we've had several conferences on this subject and experts have looked at it, including Chatham House, the problem of risk. And um, they say that we really have some big problems and it's not just the question of large-scale mon modernization of nuclear weapons, but also uh, there's more um, cyber problems than before. There's more problems with cyber attacks. And there are more nuclear weapon states. There's a, 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 a totally unpredictable situation. Still, you say that you believe that nuclear weapons could be abolished within your lifetime. What, I mean, people would say uh, that's a fine dream, but you're a dreamer. It's simply not going to happen. Well, my experience shows it to be different, actually, in the, in the worst times in the Cold War. Those were the times when the best treaties were written. And in my view, it sometimes has to get worse to get better. And I think we're now in that phase where it's got so bad that people are waking up to the problem. And certainly 122 states did just that uh, last year when they decided to adopt a treaty banning nuclear weapons. So we have a majority already in the UN for a ban on nuclear weapons. And that means to me that the chances of actually putting pressure on the nuclear weapon states has gone up and not down, that they have to actually start talking about disarmament, although they're not at the moment prepared to do so. Mm. Constanze Stelzenmüller, you're nodding. Well, <clears throat> I mean, that, I, I was nodding at that last part. I mean, I have, <laughs> um, I have enormous respect for what you do and what ICANN does, um, but, I, but I think that a majority in the UN um, is... In, in, at a time when international law seems to be under attack from all sides, mm -hmm. when large and small states are gearing up their military abilities, and not just nuclear weapons, conventional weapons, cyber capabilities, hybrid warfare capabilities, mm -hmm. and are exhibiting the, the will, the intent to use them mm -hmm. in all sorts of ways at a time when the Russians are prepared to violate uh, the, the principle of a non-aggression in, in Eastern Europe, are still in a proxy war in Ukraine and have illegally annexed a, a whole province of Ukraine, um, I'm somewhat less than confident that the nuclear states are going to bow to that prescription, much as I would like that to happen. Santhi, would you like to respond to that? Well, I can understand that, obviously. I mean, the question of whether you're optimistic or pessimistic is mostly a personal one. But uh, in this instance, I think the, the only realistic option 
to deal with this is not to lie down and say, OK, I resign. Um, the only thing that we can do is use any little bit of optimism that we have to actually stand up to the nuclear weapon states, all of them. And I don't just mean the United States, and I certainly don't mean just Russia or North Korea, I mean all of them as a group. And to say from the rest of the world, as it were, that don't have nuclear weapons, it's time to lay them down. It's absolutely um, against international law to be threatening each other, especially with annihilation. It's about time that we understood that nuclear weapons are like biological and chemical weapons, that we cannot possibly accept their use or the threat of their use. Well, to Leeming, I'd like to... You know, two things are, are the focus of the show today. The Munich Security Conference is the one, and the other one is, is the, the question, is there a new nuclear arms race emerging at this point in time? The Munich Security Conference, uh, uh, ahead of that, one commentator said, uh, we live in an era, we find ourselves suddenly in an era in which hard power increasingly trumps soft power. Is that a fair assessment? Um, I would not say so. I mean, the, the, the recent nuclear posture review from the United States, which puts uh, some billions and billions of money into modernizing the nuclear and low-yield nuclear uh, uh, weapons. Um, the question is, we had the same discussion, we were just talking about the 80s, the 80s from mutual assured destruction. Isn't it enough when both powers have, let's say, 10 intercontinental nuclear weapons and they could annihilate the whole world, actually? Then they switched over to flexible response. No, we have to be credible. And credibility is the new currency in this, in this thing. So what is happening now in the United States, they think about, you were mentioning cyber war. Cyber war, I think, is the next battle. Mm -hmm. But when a country like Russia or China or any other country is going to cyber war, how to react? Do low-yield nuclear weapons are a deterrent against cyber war, for example? And all these questions are being asked in, 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 in the surroundings. So security is, right now, it is very hard to say how to, how to be safe. The next big thing is nuclear proliferation with terrorist organizations. I think these two threats are the biggest, cyber war and, and nuclear proliferation. So the nuclear posture review, just modernizing the whole nuclear and atomic weapon system is not dealing enough with these things. They put 1% of the budget, the Pentagon puts 1% of the budget to, to anti-cyber war. So this is definitely not enough. Let's also not leave out of the picture political warfare. Um, or as one of my, my uh, Brookings colleagues in, in a book has called it, measures short of war, mm -hmm. which interfere uh, in our politics, in our societies, in our economies. It's something that the Russians are doing, but by no means only them, the Chinese, the Iranians, the Turks. Propaganda, buying people, um, disinformation, all these things which have a, a toxic effect, a destabilizing effect, which undermine the kind of trust that you would need in societies to get to the kind of agreement that you would like to see. And that are inarguably, I mean, happening every day, and are, are, you know, inflicting real-time damage on our, on our polities and on our social cohesion as we speak. And I think that is, I, I think if we, if we don't keep it firmly in mind that that is where most of the aggression currently is happening, we're losing a big part of the picture. As much as I agree, but if we're talking about, about war and, and security, 2.4 billion yeah. people are already connected to the internet. All cities and even aircraft carriers costing uh, 10 billions and more than 10 billions of dollars are heavily reliant on computerization and digitalization. Yes. If you need just two hackers exactly. to, to let one of these Attack aircraft carriers not, not, not fight anymore, mm -hmm. this is the next threat. Or, or the whole cities mm -hmm. are reliant on uh, energy, on water supply and everything else. You can sabotage them with cyber war. So I think this is a very, very big danger, and I'm afraid that all of this waste of money for the nuclear armament thing is, is really nothing else than a waste of money. Mm -hmm. Constanza, just coming back to the security conference, in the report that they issue in advance of this weekend's gathering, it says that uh, in the last year, the world got closer to the brink of significant conflict. What does that mean, closer to the brink of significant conflict? I think it means that we have seen a variety of actors who possess nuclear weapons but also significant conventional capabilities threatening each other with actual warfare. Uh, the North Koreans, 
Chinese, Americans, Russians, or, or actually under, undertaking it. Uh, all of these things add to a climate of uncertainty and risk and increase the risk of strategic miscalculation by any of the other ones. And that, I think, in taken together, has made the world significantly less safe than it was, say, a decade ago or even two years ago. Santhi. I absolutely agree with that. And I also think that um, we have to see that the nuclear weapon states, all of them are involved in one way or another in conflicts around the world. And at the moment, also, Syria has uh, several nuclear weapon states involved in it. And, um, I mean, only just uh, last week we had Israel um, involved in, in a, a strike where one of its jets was, was, uh, was brought down. And so we see that the, the, yeah, the chances of, of escalation are just going up the whole time through the fact that they're crossing each other's paths with their militaries all the time. And we still have the unresolved problem between India and Pakistan, which keeps going up and down all the time and has always uh, uh, had us on, on the brink of a, of a major... I mean, just that, for instance, take that for... Uh, what would happen if India and Pakistan had a limited nu um, nuclear war, which we call limited, but, yeah, but say... Wouldn't, wouldn't we, we worked this out with a, a study, IPPN did, did a study on what would happen if 50... On both sides, 50 nuclear weapons, small nuclear weapons, were used. Um, it would have effects globally that we, we've never seen before. It just plunged us into a period of time where there was um, less sunlight and less rain and we would literally have uh, millions and millions of people dying from starvation because we couldn't grow enough food. Okay, and well, uh, those but, are the but, things but we're looking at. But on the other hand, I, I would say... Um, I might disagree a little because, for mm -hmm. example, the, the, the great power competition, I think, is not a real threat. China has no imperial ambitions, not at all. United States is, in a way, war fatigue after Afghanistan, after Iraq, after all, spending all these billions of dollars in, in wasteless wars. I mean, the, the, the experience with going to war is not so good, even for the Russians conquering the Crimean Peninsula is is they are stuck now in East Ukraine, losing their soldiers, wasting their money, and for what gains? They don't gain anything. Right, I'm going to have to disagree so, with uh, this. So, <laughs> yeah. so the experience going to war, the experience in the 19th century, from the beginning of the 20th century with the First World War, is you can conquer land, you can have resources, you can even colonize other parts of the city, you could be bigger and more powerful. These bigger and more powerful with going to war is nothing... Show me the war where people come out bigger and more powerful. You just don't okay. have it. Um, Marte, um, yes, it is true that the Russians end up, end up with spectacularly bad real estate. I mean, North Ossetia, Abkhazia... OK, Abkhazia is actually quite nice. But North Ossetia and Crimea are nobody's idea of sort of really strategic acquisitions. Um, and I think what, what, was, what, what was done here, I think, was more done for political purposes than for anything else. However, it is not true to say that Russia and China currently are status quo powers. Uh, the Chinese are, are building out islands in the Pacific hell for leather. Uh, the Russians are revisionist power. Uh, the Americans have been messaging to their allies and to the world that they are considering the ability, the, 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 a so-called bloody nose strike against North Korea. Uh, most of their allies have been saying, please don't do this. There is no way of containing such a strike. But it is being apparently very seriously considered in Washington. So we should not assume that while it is true that, that the American uh, the citizenry is, is tired of the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, um, there are still a lot of American forces out in Afghanistan and in Iraq and are likely to remain there for a very long time. And it is entirely possible that war will come to them even if they don't want to pursue it. And, and as, we, as, we, as we keep hearing in Washington every day, um, there are wars they are willing to pursue. OK. I'll break you off there just for a second, break the conversation off. We go, go to some pitches. The key question we're addressing on the show today is how great is the threat of nuclear conflict? Well, that threat suddenly seemed very real very recently to the people of Hawaii. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no kidding. Last month, a false alarm about a ballistic missile attack caused panic in the U.S. state of Hawaii. For nearly 40 minutes, it seemed as though an attack was imminent. The public response may have had something to do with concerns about the international nuclear arms race. 
For several years now, North Korean leader Kim Jong-un has been provoking the U.S. with nuclear weapons tests. China has also increased its nuclear forces. Russia has modernized its nuclear arsenal. And several other countries are trying to develop nuclear weapons. Washington is taking these developments very seriously. The U.S. plans to spend $1.2 trillion over the next three decades to maintain and modernize its nuclear arsenal. Are we now facing an increased threat of nuclear war? Santhi Hall, that episode in Hawaii at the beginning of that report, can you remember what went through your mind when you caught oh. up with what was, go what was happening there? I remember very well how I reacted to that. I was thrown back into the 80s. I, was, mm. I remembered personally a situation as a 19-year-old where I heard a siren go off in Birmingham where I was living at the time and I thought, that's the end of the world. It's happening now and I have to find, how can I get to my loved ones? And I knew I didn't have the time. And I really, really uh, sympathised with people. I know people in Hawaii who got that message and, and oh wrote dear. on, oh uh, on mm -hmm. Twitter mm -hmm. and were saying, we don't know what to do, we can't, you know, where should we go? And it, it was just... Uh, a, a horrible moment yeah. for me because it brought back actually the reason why I'm working on this mm. subject mm. now. Yeah. Malta, I sense you. Yes, any, any, and I completely agree. N nuclear arms are still something that causes people nightmares. Mm. Um, still, and, 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 and rightly so. I mean, every use of a nuclear weapon would be immoral because innocent people would die in, a, in an amount of scale that we, nobody of us can, can achieve. But in the age of nuclear deterrence, is you are threatening with the use of something in order not to use it. This is, this is the logic, the rational of, of deterrence. So the whole formula saying the more people are threatening each other with the use of something, the more likely it is that they go to war, is per se not true in itself. It can be they're threatening in order not to use it. And this, you, you just have to, have to, this is the rational of, of nuclear deterrence. So when, 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 when Donald Trump, the president of the United States, is talking about using any kind of nuclear weapons in, let's say, North Korea, his aim is he's talking about in order not to use it. And to to come up with that. Surely his message is actually quite explicit. We've got a we've got a relatively unsophisticated, a very impetuous U.S. president whose 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 message, it seems to me, is is much more to the Iranians, to the North Koreans. We will use our nuclear capacities. Yeah, and this is his me his message. But his message doesn't mean he will use it. His message is, I give you the message in order not to use it. Malta, so this I'm is sorry. the rational... No, I'm, I'm sorry. I this is the rational look, of deterrence. I don't work you for have IPP and W, but I can't follow you <laughs> in the least. I mean, I, that, that's... You that, have somebody with an immoral act in order not to fulfil the act. This is the logic of deterrence. Yes, it is the yes, logic of deterrence. Yes, but it ain't deterrence. working. It is the it logic, is working and now it's not logical. Since 45. <laughs> it is working now since 45. Malta, please. Sorry, I mean, I, I, th I think you're, I, I think you're climbing up a pole that you will find it very difficult to come down from, <laughs> um, and I would like, you, like to prevent you from doing that. <laughs> right now, we've got a situation that is completely different from the traditional logic of deterrence, where you had essentially, you know, ICBMs, intermediate uh, range weapons, and, and, and a small, small, small batches of tactical nuclear weapons that were carefully set up in such a way as to produce exactly the effect you suggest. Right now, you have people talking about the the actual battlefield use of nuclear weapons in ways that were, would have been considered outrageously irresponsible by their predecessors during the Cold War. Mm -hmm. I agree. And, and I, I don't think... Uh, I, I do, it is very clear from the things that the President of America has said that he believes nuclear weapons can and should be used, and he's not saying it just to, to threaten people. In, 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 he's not saying know? that he How won't use it. Be because of the way he said it, and because <laughs> because his own because he the looked people, so serious when he said it. Because the people who work for him <laughs> that's are part terrified. Of, that's part of it. Yes, that's yes. that's what they and should. And the be. reason why they're terrified is that they believe that he believes he would use they them. They should. They it's, should. Exactly. So that's in what's other words, that can't. No, that's no, we are again. That's what's called no, deterrence. No, it contradicts what you've just no, said. No. Deterrence is not supposed it to deter what I'm the. I'm sorry. Deterrence is not supposed to, to terrify the advisers of an American president. It's supposed to deter your opponents. 
OK. Mm. That, there is a big Opponents difference there. Opponents should believe that I'm serious. Yes. That's what they are doing, because you are doing that. So it's working. No. Everything Marta, proves I'm, it's I'm, working. I'm sorry. Look, it, 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 this is just not true. And, and I think you know better. In fact, um, and, it's, and, and I don't want to keep harping on the current American president, the uh, two presidents ago, George W. Bush, had his advisers work on nuclear, a nuclear posture review, which also considered the usability of tactical nuclear weapons in the form of so-called bunker busters and, other, and, and others. And this was had nothing to do with deterrence, as American specialists knew very well at the time. So our problem, I think, is, and this is where I think you and I are closer to each other, is, is that we are seeing a loosening up of the logic, an undermining of the logic of deterrence, which undermines it even for those weapons which are supposed never to be used. No, but the situation but today is, is completely uh, different. We, you, don't, we don't have an ideological confrontation as in the Cold War. We don't have confrontations right now of fighting uh, about resources or anything else. So it's not, it's not the great power competition we are used to face. So it's, what is lacking is the whole rational of going to war. What? The rational of going to war. But, but Martin, Nobody, I mean, you, there's we, great power competition all around us. There is great what power is the United competition States between the Americans and the Russians. using a nuclear weapon on North Korea? Nothing. Innocent deaths, uh, huge insecurities, my problem everything is not else. That, that, so that my problem is not that Trump will in, uh, decide to use an, a nuclear weapon on North Korea. My problem is that he'll provoke possibly exactly. a use of nuclear weapons by like Kim Jong-un by yeah. the rhetoric that he's been mm. using. Mm. And he putting, he's putting him in a corner. Also, I feel the same way, I have to say, about Russia. Even if one sees them as being just as aggressive, one sees also these corners that, that, that they're putting each other into through particular kinds of rhetoric. But I'd like to go back to what you said before about it's worked for 45 years. The fact is that deterrence has not kept the, the, the peace in, in 45 years because there are several instances where it failed and, it, and we can say at least one we know of with Stanislav Petrov where he saved the world, not deterrence, because they actually thought that, uh, that, that there was um, an attack. Was. Sorry, yes, that's absolutely true. Stanislav Petrov saved the world in, um, I can remember, can't remember the date. The late 90s. In the, in the mm. late 90s, in the moment where he thought that there was a, a rocket attack coming in, a missile attack coming in from the United States, and he was absolutely sure that this could not be the case. And so he didn't give that up, to, up the, the line of command to for them to make the decision to send the missiles back again. And he was right, it turned again. out to be a malfunction of the, of the, of, right. of, of, of the, the, the signalling exactly. system. Exactly, but normally, but, under the logic of yeah, deterrence, he should have done. War. He went mm. against yeah. his training and said, I will make a personal decision here, and he decided not to do that. And that, there are several instances where that's happened, and we okay. were just lucky. Point yeah. made, point yeah. made, point yeah. accepted, yeah. Uh, I'd just like to take the conversation in a little bit of a different direction. Okay. You, you mentioned the countries that have signed up to the UN Pro nuclear prohibition treaty. Mm -hmm. What about the countries like uh, that, that, that haven't signed up? Like, let's take China, for example. Let's take Russia. What kind of leverage does a, a Nobel Prize-winning organisation like your own have with governments like Russia and China? Well, ICAN is not just looking at two of the nine nuclear weapon states. We treat them as a whole group. With any of these group. nations that haven't yeah, signed up. This, I mean, the point, the point of the, the treaty is not to single out... Uh, nuclear weapon states, but to say these are the states that don't have nuclear weapons and they feel threatened by those that do. And so they want nuclear weapons banned. That's, mm. that's what's happened with this treaty. Mm. And the idea is to use this treaty for um, those states to put pressure on the states that do have nuclear weapons to start negotiations on disarmament. And that's, that's the... Uh, they're, they're using the idea of building a norm uh, of delegitimizing nuclear weapons and nuclear deterrence in order to get us there because we're stuck in a position at the moment where nothing is happening but modernization and uh, an arms race is starting. And so we have to do something very drastic here. And when you talk about legitimacy, yes or no, legitimacy or not, Germany has nuclear weapons on its right. territory. Is it right to do so? 
I, I personally think that there's no reason to have those... Even if you were following the logic of deterrence, I don't see a reason to have those nuclear weapons here. One could use them, in fact, to signal that one wants to move away from this doctrine of nuclear deterrence. And the, the German uh, government has been consistently saying that they're in favour of a nuclear weapon-free world. But I haven't yet seen any concrete... I mean, look at the, the, the coalition agreement. I haven't seen any concrete ideas in the this for how we're going to actually okay. arrive at any kind of nuclear And on silence. that very contemporary note, the music's come up. We're going to have to leave it there. Our topic today here on Quadriga has been the new arms race, a more dangerous world. I hope we've given you plenty of food for thought. Thanks for joining us. Until next time, bye-bye and tschüss. <laughs>